Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead, uh, for my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual although they are unreal. Appear factual, although they are real. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Who is eternally existent in a transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in a transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate world. upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitra Votra. Dharma Pujita Kaitabutra Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shivadam Tapo Trayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Pereer Ishwaraha Kimva Pereer Ishwaraha Sajur Hidi Abrudhi Tetra Sajur Hidi Abrudhi Tetra Kriti Bihi Susu Subhistakshana Kriti Bihi Susu Subhistakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated Completely rejecting all religious activities which are material motivated. This Bhagavat Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavat Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth is the reality distinguished from religion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. Such a truth uproots the threefold mysteries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of the other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpatarur galitam palam. Nigama kalpatarur galitam palam. Sukhamukad amrita drabya samyutam. Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam. Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam. Muhur Aho Raska Bhuvi Bhavakaha. Muhur Aho Raska Bhuvi Bhavakaha. O oh, expert and thoughtful man, relish Shrimad Bhagavatam. O oh, expert and thoughtful man, relish Shrimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. The mature fruit, the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all. Including liberated souls. Including Including the breaded souls. Shrimvatam Swakata Krishna. Shrimvatam Swakata Krishna. Punya Shravana Kirtana. Punya Shravana Kirtana. Ridhyantak Stohiya Bhadrani. Ridhyayanta Stohiya Bhadrani. Vidhu Nati Surit Satam. Vidhu Nati Surit Satam. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures. Or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. 
It's a self-righteous activity. It is self-righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, and for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's acts heart. Acts as the best wishing friend. Acts as the best wishing and friend. And purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. And, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of Nasta him. Preshu, Badreshu, Nasta Preshu, Badreshu, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavati Uttama Sloke, Bhagavati Uttama Sloke, Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki, Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his transcendental dormant knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava, Tadarajas tamo bhava, Kamalo badayas chaye, Kamalo badayas chaye, Chete taranavidam, Chete taranavidam, Stitham satve prasiddhati, Stitham sarvat prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, by development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yogataha. Bhagavat bhakti yogata. Bhagavat tattva vigyanam. Bhagavat tattva vigyanam. Mukta sangha sujayate. Mukta sangha sujayate. When these impurities are wiped away. When his impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. When he remains steady in his pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service. Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God perfectly. Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. Thus, the Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage where some say on summer ground. Enables one to come at one to the stage of samsha samagrama. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16. We're going to go over some more texts 26 to 30. And so yesterday we covered an interesting point. was yeah the living beings can appreciate the qualities of the Lord as the ultimate goal but they cannot attain the status of such equality Is that what we discussed? What are we saying? Mm. So we're talking about equalities. Uh. Yeah, equality. As we discussed that, equality and neutrality. Right. Today we're going to discuss another point, an important point here. So it says, the transcendental service of the Lord is itself a transcendental benefit for the devotee, and therefore the devotee has nothing to expect from the Lord. On the assertion of the Vedic aphorism, Sarvam Klav Idam Brahma, we can understand that the Lord, by the omnipresent rays of his effulgence, called Brahma Jyoti, is all pervading inside or outside of everything like the omnipresent material sky, and thus he is also omniscient. Okay, so the Brahma Jyoti is a very uh, profound and mysterious expansion of the Lord because it has 
It is a spiritual light. It's not a material light. And the spiritual light comes into the material world also by being reflected off of the sun. And therefore, the sun uh, expansion of light and, and heat, uh, and electromagnetism and so forth, is uh, maintaining all life in the universe. So, what is this light? And we've discussed this before, but I want to go over it again because it's extremely important. So, in the Brahma Samhita 521, it says that in the purport, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur writes, the jivas are the infinitesimal particles of his spiritual effulgence and are therefore not perishable like mundane things. Jivas, being particles of God's effulgent rays, exhibit on a minute scale the qualities of the divinity. Hence jivas are identical with the principles of knowledge, knower, egoism, enjoyer, meditator, and doer. Krishna is the all-pervading, all-extending Supreme Lord, while jivas have a different nature from his being his atomic particles. The eternal relationship consists in this, that the Supreme Lord is the eternal master and the jivas are his eternal servants. Jivas have also sufficient eligibility in respect to the mellow quality of the divinity. Aparayamitasthvanyam pakritim vidime param by this verse of the Gita, it is made known that jivas are his transcendental potency. All the qualities of the unalloyed soul are above the eightfold qualities, such as egotism, etc., pertaining to his achit potency, or maya potency. Hence, the jiva potency, though very small in magnitude, is still superior to the achit potency, or maya. This potency has another name, uh, which is tatasta, or marginal potency, being located on the line demarcating the spheres of the spiritual and mundane potencies. He is susceptible to the influence of material energy owing to his small magnitude, but so long as he remains submissive to Krishna, the lord of maya, he is not liable to the influence of maya. The worldly afflictions, births and rebirths, are concomitants of the fettered or uh, condition of souls fallen into the clutches of the deluding potency from a time that has no beginning. So what does this mean exactly in plain words? It means that we don't really understand who we are and what is our real potential. We are so dumbed down by modern education that we think birth, death, old age and disease is a normal part of life and, it, and that there's nothing we can do about it. We can try but there's nothing we can do about it. But all that is not true. It's all illusory uh, and the whole idea of suffering in the material world and the struggle for existence is unnecessary. It's artificially imposed on us by our own attraction to Maya. The attraction to Maya is what entraps us in the material world of suffering. And people are very, very, uh, let's say, uh, they object to getting out of it. They want to stay in it. They want to suffer. And they think it's heroic to suffer in the material world. Although they don't like it. And they're doing everything they can to stop suffering. But still, uh, it's happening. So here, this, this is explaining the real nature of our soul. Uh, although we're a minute, infinitesimal particle of Krishna, 
the great soul, the greatest soul, still we're very, very powerful. We have the power to even control the sun, but we don't realize it. Just like Vivaswan. Vivaswan is a jiva. But yet, he's controlling the movement of the sun. And Prabhupada says in the in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that the jiva has the potency to even control the sun. Now, it seems like something impossible to us. It's only because of ignorance. Ignorance is so profound. It's just like a donkey. A donkey uh, will actually approach the she donkey for sex, and he'll come from the uh, from the backside of the donkey, and he'll uh, uh, also sing some poetry. Hee haw, hee haw. That's poetry in uh, donkey language. And when she hears that, she gives him a very very hard kick right in the face. You see. <laughs> so that is the life of a donkey. But what is the difference between the life of the donkey and the life of the human being who's attached to sex life? No difference. No difference at all. It's the same thing. So when things are used incorrectly, they become sources of suffering. So there's a always a right way and a wrong way in, in life, in the material world. So people have become convinced that the wrong way is the right way. And because of that, there's no end to the suffering. And it's only if you hear very carefully the Vedic knowledge on a regular basis, I and mean, it has to be daily, because our tendency to forget things is so profound that uh, we might understand something yesterday, and today we forgot about it already. That's how profound this forgetfulness is. So here it says that this Brahma Jyoti is made up of infinitesimal particles of his, meaning Krishna's, effulgence, and therefore not perishable like mundane things. Jivas, being particles of Godhead's effulgent rays exhibit on a minute scale the qualities of the divinity. Now yesterday, when I was at the farm, uh, we have made a new box just recently, like uh, a week or 10 days ago. And already, new, very thin, green grass is growing in that box. It came up in that 10 day period because there's been a lot of rain. And I was thinking about it, I said, gee, this is amazing, you know. We just, we just, we, we dug the, the ground to the point where it was below the root level and still they came up. They still came up. So I was thinking about this. How is this possible? Well, there's some very interesting uh, information in the Bhagavad Gita to help us understand that. Now, notice I said it happened in the last 10 days, and it's been raining a lot in the last 10 days, right? So in the Bhagavad Gita, I think it's the eighth chapter, let me take a good look here. Uh, yeah, the eighth chapter, ninth verse. It says, one should meditate upon the Supreme Person as the one who knows everything, as he who is the oldest, who is the controller, who is smaller than the smallest, and who is maintainer, the maintainer of everything, who is beyond all material conception, who is inconceivable, and who is always a person. He is luminous like the sun, and he is transcendental beyond this material nature. Well, in the purport, Prabhupada says, the process of thinking of the Supreme is mentioned in this verse. The foremost point is that he is not impersonal or void. One cannot meditate on something impersonal or void. That is, the very, that is very difficult. 
The process of thinking of Krishna, however, is very easy and is factually stated herein. First of all, the Lord is Purusha, a person. We think of the person Rama and the person Krishna. And whether one thinks of Rama or of Krishna, what he, he is like is described in this verse of Bhagavad Gita. The Lord is Kavi, that is, he knows past, present, and future, and therefore knows everything. He is the oldest personality because he is the origin of everything. Everything is born out of him. He is the supreme controller of the universe, and he is the maintainer and instructor of humanity. He is smaller than the smallest. The living entity is one ten thousandth part of the tip of a hair. But the Lord is so inconceivably small that he enters into the heart of this particle. Now, one time uh, in a discussion with uh, Bhakti Srub Damodar Maharaj, uh, the question came up, I think it was with him, about uh, the heart. And Maharaj said, well, Prabhupada, uh, scientists have say that uh, a worm doesn't have a heart. And Prabhupada said, what? He, says, he said, he said the, the worm doesn't have a heart. And he said, how do you know? He said, well, they've looked for it, they haven't found it. He says, but that does not mean it doesn't have a heart. There are so many things they look for and don't find. However, he said, Krishna says that he's in the heart of every living entity. That means the worm also has a heart, whether you see it or not. <laughs> so uh, this is very interesting because uh, here we have two points of view. One is what the scientists can see and not see and what the Shastra says. Now again, which one are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the scientists who see and don't see things? Why? Because they have imperfect senses. Even if they use microscopes and telescopes, they're still trying to see with their imperfect eyes, no matter how much the microscope can magnify or the telescope can magnify. So therefore, it means that although they're going to see things, uh, even through a microscope, their the seeing is still going to be defective because uh, their, their seeing power is defective. Okay, so uh, this, this is a, an important point. Uh, now there's another important point I wanted to make here, and that is, one second, let me find it. Uh, Prabhupada explains that the jivas, they fall down from the spiritual world and usually they begin by being a Brahma. And from that point, they can go up or down. And us but usually they go down. And how do they take birth? Uh, so it says that the jivas fall down as, as drops of rain. And then they appear as plants, basically grass or different grains. A grass is a type of grain also. So that explains now why, I'm, why I saw this new grass growing after only 10 days. Those are all jivas that have fallen down. And then how do, how do living entities subsist? They subsist by eating grains, right? Grains are the main food uh, for living entities, including human beings. So uh, this is an uh, explanation in the Bhagavad Gita. I'm trying to find... Uh, which verse it is? Uh, let me see here. Okay, if I don't find it now, I'll find it later on, and we'll come back to it. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, these are mysterious things that are happening. And unless we read the Shastras, we'll never be able to understand them. Now, the other point is that on the assertion of the Vedic aphorism, Sarvam Klav Idam Brahma, we can understand that the Lord, by the omnipresent rays of his effulgence, called Brahma Jyoti, is all pervading inside or outside of everything, like the omnipresent material sky, and thus he is also omniscient. Okay, so Krishna is present everywhere as Paramatma and also as Brahma Jyoti. Paramatma is present in every atom of the universe and in the heart of every living entity. And the Brahma Jyoti is also present everywhere. Uh, it, it's the substratum or the support of the spiritual and material world. So, therefore, uh, the jivas are everywhere in material creation. They're not just on the uh, planet Earth. They're everywhere in the universe. All this is mysterious. And uh, it's very difficult uh, for scientists and philosophers to understand this. Why? Because they can only understand matter. That's what they're saying now. That they, don't, they don't deal with spirit because they can't see it. They can't measure it. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So there's so many things they can't see and they can't measure. But yet, sometimes they theorize that they exist. Uh, like in, in mathematics, there are certain things like uh, numbers that are non-existent, like the square root of minus one. But without using that, they can't solve certain problems uh, in, in mathematics. And the same thing in physics. They assume certain things exist that they can't prove exist, but it's very helpful for them to prove things or uh, other things by using those imaginary things to, to help them uh, uh, you know, with their uh, mathematics or their physics. So, therefore, they accept things that they can't see and they can't prove in order to help them prove other things. See? So this, this is the nature of the cheating of the scientists. They won't accept the principle of the soul or God, but they will accept things like square root of minus one to help them solve problems. So we're dealing with a multiple, many levels of, of uh, hypocrisy and cheating. And because of that, we don't believe what we read in the scriptures. Uh, so the scriptures, such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, are giving us all the knowledge necessary to become liberated from the cycle of birth and death, but yet we are fighting it because of, of being conditioned by material uh, lies. Okay, so therefore, uh, there's another interesting point, and that is, uh, when we talk about Sanjaya, Sanjaya is a very interesting person in the Bhagavad Gita. Why? Because he has vision through mystic television. He ha it's a, he's seeing in his heart through some type of communication what's happening in Kurukshetra. It's, it's called mystic meditation. right? Just like you watch television or we watch television and we see what's happening in San Francisco and St. Louis and uh, India and so forth, right? But that is, we, we understand it because it's, it's based on electromagnetic waves. By the way, we don't see those electromagnetic waves. Do you see any in this room right now? No, but you have a phone, right? Does your phone, how come it works? Huh? Right, so therefore there must be electromagnetic waves in this room right now. Right? You don't see it, but yet you see it because by its effect. Your, your cell phone is picking up images and 
voices and uh, so many things from very far away. Right? That you could, you could right now you could call India if you wanted, right? But if you wanted to go to India, it would take you a long time. You'd have to go to the airport, wait in line, you have to have a ticket, you have to have your passport, you know. And in order to transfer your body from Seattle, to, let's say to Mumbai, you need the help of thousands of people, thousands, not not five or ten people, thousands of people. Already, uh, Boeing and the Airbus they they employ about over a hundred thousand people to build the airplane. So there, that's already a hundred thousand right there. Right? Then you have the governments, right? You have to get permission, by by the way, to pass over the, uh, uh, let's say, the territory of different countries. So those, all that has to be uh, as part of the airplane flying through the air, right? And then you have the maintenance people, you have the customs, and and you have the immigration people, and some. If you count all the people, it's thousands of people to help you transfer your body from Seattle to Mumbai, right? But we take it for granted. We say, oh, it's, you know, we don't, we're not thinking about it. So the fact that we're not conscious of these things, but yet you're just sitting here, you could call up uh, your mother right now, who's in India, and hear her perfectly. It's, it's, it's amazing. But see, even more amazing than that is Sanjaya without the telephone. Without the network of electromagnetism and all that, or, or cables or all that stuff, he was seeing what's happening in Kurukshetra, although he's sitting in Delhi. And he's hearing it. And he's describing it perfectly. And that's why we have Bhagavad Gita. So there are many things that scientists don't know about. Many, many things. And they won't know about it as long as they keep this fanatic idea that the, it's the only thing that counts is matter, or that life comes from matter. That's another false concept. Life doesn't come from matter. Life comes from life. Right. Okay, so Prabhupada writes, but there are better telephones that they do not know about. In Bhagavad Gita, Sanjaya demonstrated this when he was sitting with his master, Dhritarashtra, and relating all the affairs that were taking place far away on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Sanjaya's vision was actually greater than the telephone. It was mystic television. It was television within the heart, for he was sitting in a room far from the battlefield and still seeing everything that was occurring there. In Bhagavad Gita, Dhritarashtra inquired of Sanjaya, how are my sons and nephews? What are they doing? Then Sanjaya described how Duryodhan was going to Dronacharya, what Dronacharya was speaking, how Duryodhan was replying, and so on, even though those activities were too far away to be seen by ordinary eyes. Sanjaya could see and describe them through his mystic power. This is real science. So which one are we going to believe? This junk science that's all full of lies and misconceptions? an imperfect observation, or the real science as giving in the uh, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. This is a fundamental question that we have to answer. So in this purport, which is very elaborate, and many, many uh, important things are discussed, it could take years for us to understand all the points Prabhupada has made. And if we understand just even a few points from this purport, uh, it can save us from great suffering in the material world. But if we take the time to understand uh, even this one purport, by going over it carefully, discussing it, researching things that we don't know, uh, it can lead to becoming very fixed up in Krishna consciousness. That's how powerful Bhagavatam is. One verse, one word, even one syllable is enough to save a person from the cycle of birth and death if they take the time to try and understand it properly. Okay, so the main point is 
so even though the Lord is equally well-wishing to everyone, the unfortunate living being, due to bad association only, is unable to accept his instructions in toto, meaning completely. They might take some part of it, but not completely. And for this, the Lord is never to be blamed. He is called the well-wisher for the devotees only. He appears to be partial to his devotees, but factually the matter rests on the living being to accept or reject equal treatment by the Lord. He's equal to everyone, but are we going to accept Acceptance is regulated, regulated principles. That's the acceptance. If we follow the regulated principles of Krishna consciousness very, uh, let's say, expertly day after day, that means we're accepting Krishna. And if we don't follow them uh, strictly, that means that we're accepting partially or nothing. And therefore, we are responsible for our own ignorance, not Krishna. We are responsible for our own suffering, not Krishna. We are responsible for being in illusion, not Krishna. Okay, I'll stop right there. Are there any questions? Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Come and speak into the microphone. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, in 8.3, it's given that, you know, jivas descend uh, in the form of rain. Oh, yeah, okay. It's 8.3. Thank you Fine. for telling me. In the process of sacrifice, the living entity makes specific sacrifice to attain specific heavenly planets and consequently reaches them. When the merit of sacrifice is exhausted, the living entity descends to earth in the form of rain, then takes on the form of grains and the grains are eaten by man and transformed into semen, which impregnates a woman. Semen. Semen, which impregnates a woman, and thus the living entity once again attains the human form to perform sacrifice and so repeat the same cycle. In this way, the living entity perpetually comes and goes on the material path. Yeah, there it is. Thank you very much. Yeah, I knew it was in the eighth chapter. I just have to take a note here. So now, if you read this, let's say uh, you have a science class, and they're saying that you know we all come from monkeys, and the monkey came from a one cell uh, that was in a primordial soup somewhere in the North Pole, and some uh, lightning struck it, and all of a sudden the first the cell came up, uh, came uh, came into existence by this fortuitous uh, conjunction of circumstances of the primordial soup and primordial soup and the uh, uh, lightning. Ah, there's an explanation. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then here it says that the, uh, by performing sacrifices to, to the demigods and to Krishna, uh, the living entity descends when the merit of sacrifice is exhausted after the living entities go up to the planets, planets of the devas when their uh, uh, punya is exhausted uh, or the merit of sacrifice is exhausted the living entity descends to the earth in the form of rain then takes on the form of grains and the grains are eaten by man just like the grass is growing, right? So some, there's different types of grasses, uh, like barley, you know, jowar, and there's uh, sorghum, uh, and so forth, and, and wheat. And so human beings eat the wheat, and the cows eat the grass, right? And this way, a living entity uh, will take, take birth. Uh, then takes, the f uh, takes on the form of grains, and the grains are eaten by man and transformed into semen, 
which impregnates women and thus living entity, once again attains the human form to perform sacrifice and so repeat the same cycle. Now, do you think anyone would believe that if you, if you read it to them? <laughs> huh? No, they wouldn't believe it. They say, "What? This is this is crazy. This is like Disney World. You know, it has nothing to do with science." You see? So this is the problem we're dealing with. And uh, uh, then why should a devotee? Like one time I asked Sadaputta, who's you know PhD, uh, math math uh, math major, and also a, a physics, and, uh, let's say major. He's a brilliant person. I said, how did, how did you begin to believe what you were reading in Prabhupada's books? And I don't know if you know Sadhaputra and I've heard his name. He's the one who wrote that, that magazine, Origins, and he's written many books. Uh, and he was like the number one scientist in uh, the Bhaktivedanta Institute. He said, well, he said it was a little, it was difficult. He said, because I was trained in science and math. But when the, the, what convinced me was Prabhupada himself. He said, he was so certain of what he was talking about and he was able to always answer all questions. And he said, it was his personality that convinced me. Right. So, but I mean, Someone who's trained his whole life, he's a PhD, right? And he reads this, and it says, A living entity descends to earth in the form of rain, then takes on the form of grains, and grains are eaten by man and transformed into semen, <laughs> which impregnates a woman, and thus the living entity once again attains the human form to perform sacrifice and to repeat the same cycle. So you say to yourself, wait a minute. You know, I mean, after all his studies in science, he's going to believe this explanation. It's only because he met Prabhupada and he associated with him and he saw him and heard him and that's what convinced him to believe this. See? So it's not a question of study. It's a question of association. Just like he associated so many years with the demons to get his PhD, right? So after all that association, you end up believing what they say, right? But because of his association with Prabhupada, he began to believe what he was reading in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. And because of that, he did a lot of tremendous work trying to convince others uh, of the same truth that he was convinced of. Yes. Yeah, but it's, that's just a state by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Like, you can never understand Shastra. You can never understand Shastra just by reading. You have to hear from self-realized. So that's what Prabhupada was self-realized. Therefore, that that was that's had an impact. By hearing his guru. Yeah, by hearing from the sadhu, you know, self-realized, and then. Uh, that touches the soul because it's knowledge of the soul. So, whereas science, scientific knowledge is on the mental platform, so it should be the soul to soul, you know, transmission of the knowledge. We hear when we hear from self-realized, then you can understand just by mere reading. It's difficult to understand. No, reading is not enough. Reading is not enough. Mm -hmm. You actually have to hear the knowledge from. It genuine devotee, then you can understand. And it has to be regular hearing. Right. Okay, any other questions? If not, thank you for that comment. Yes? Come to the mic.